7 KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And just into the KSAT 12 newsroom, two men shot by Bear County Sheriff's deputies over the weekend have been identified. Bear County Sheriff's Office identifying 38 year old Daniel McLeod as the man they say pointed two handguns at deputies. It happened Saturday morning in the 2600 block of Muddy Peak that's in far west Bear County. According to the Sheriff's Office, McLeod shot several times after pointing those guns at deputies. He still tried to escape in his car. McLeod eventually arrested and treated at the scene. He's been charged with two counts of aggravated assault against a public servant. The identities of the two deputies who opened fire have not been released there. They are a 19 year and 11 year veteran with the Bear County Sheriff's Office. The other man recovering and facing charges has been identified as 19 year old Samuel Eric Castillo. According to the Sheriff's Office, Castillo led deputies on a chase on the southwest side before getting out of his vehicle and then waving a gun at deputies. A deputy shot him once in the upper body. He was taken to University Hospital for treatment. He is expected to recover. The deputy who shot him has been with the department for one year. Castillo has been charged with aggravated assault against a public servant and evading arrest. You may be able to help people living in a far west side neighborhood frustrated about something a lot of South Texas neighbors have experienced. Their mailboxes have been broken into on several occasions. The latest time it happened was caught on camera. Jaffney Gray spoke with neighbors who say they hope this footage sends a message to the perpetrators. One time it was all the sections. Most of the time it's the same section that's getting hit. Residents living near Arrowhead Trail are beyond aggravated with the number of mailbox break-ins they've experienced over time. We're being hit like three or four times. I have quite a few packages stalling out of there. The most recent break in this past Friday in broad daylight. This veteran who asked not to be identified caught it all on camera. Since the man shown in the video has not been identified by police, we are blurring his face. The veteran told me he had this camera installed to watch for when the mail would arrive, but he had no idea he'd be catching a person who's causing this very frustration in the neighborhood. And within less than two minutes, he pops open the back of one section of the mailbox over there and reaches in and grabs some mail out gets in his truck and he's gone. Every time this happens, it takes months before residents impacted can simply walk to their mailbox for mail. Instead, they have to go to the post office, which can be a lot, especially for the elderly. I have been at the post office waiting in line for like an hour and 20 minutes. And it's a hassle, not just for me, for everybody in the community as well. They're only hurting people, especially in this pan pandemic, when people are down in their luck, they're, they're trying to survive and he's taking stuff away from them. The veteran says he hopes his footage inspires change in his community. I hope it stops him and I hope it kind of forces the, the Postal Service to replace these old 30 year old mailboxes. They're easy to pop open. The veteran did report this to the San Antonio Police Department and the U.S. Postal Service. In the meantime, he's encouraging all of his fellow neighbors to constantly check on your mail and to sign up for the informed delivery option with the U.S. Postal Service. That way, once your mail has been delivered, you're notified right away. On the far west side, Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. For the second year in a row, Fiesta events are being affected by the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. The party with a purpose, along with the Texas Cavaliers River Parade, push back until June. But the Battle of Flowers and Fiesta Flambeau parades for this year have been canceled altogether. The Fiesta Com Commission says the decision to postpone was made based on recommendations from Metro Health and City of San Antonio officials. The president of the Fiesta Flambeau Parade Association says COVID-19 has already affected their members and they are not taking any chances. But we are doing it for, like I said, the, uh, the, the spectators and the participants for their health and safety, which is our number one concern. Now, if you have already purchased tickets to these canceled parades, you can request a refund. For more information, visit ksat.com. We also have an updated list of the Fiesta events that have been canceled or postponed due to coronavirus concerns. With the pandemic, a lot of people worried about their health, especially those without health insurance. Texas is one of 12 states to have not adopted Medi Medicaid expansion. However, some local leaders hope the pandemic will provide state lawmakers enough of a nudge to change that. 
Garrett Berger with what that could mean. Generally working odd contract jobs, Robert Lawrence's work doesn't give him health insurance, nor does it pay enough for him to get coverage on his own. The marketplace is usually like just so expensive, you know? And so I really, I, I feel like it's almost a waste of my time. But there's not really another option for single adults like him. The associate director of the Policy Institute, Every Texan, says Texas Medicaid largely covers children in its current form. We cover seniors over 65 if they're in poverty, and we cover people who are adults who are fully disabled. But other than that, we cover almost no adults. Opting to expand Medicaid coverage would also make those earning under a certain threshold eligible for it, too with the feds covering most of the cost. Both the city and county have made that part of their legislative priorities for this session. I think there is finally some momentum here in our state to expand Medicaid. As part of the 2010 Affordable Care Act, Medicaid expansion has tended to be a partisan issue in Texas. Dunkelberg says factors like potential budget savings and the strain COVID-19 has put on Texans mean more Republicans might consider it this session. You know, way too soon to tell whether we will succeed. Undocumented people and those who make too much still wouldn't be covered. But a Texas A&M study using pre-pandemic data still estimates Medicaid expansion would make 101,000 uninsured Bear County residents eligible. Given his income level, Lawrence could be among them, which would be a weight off his mind. But you don't know what you're going to have to do you know, just to survive. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Governor Greg Abbott will be speaking in less than an hour to lay out his legislative agenda for the current session. You can see if Medicaid expansion makes that list by watching his address live on our website, KSAT.com. One man is dead after an apparent freak accident in far west Bear County this morning, crushed beneath the wheels of a semi. It happened at a job site along Highway 90, just inside Texas State Highway 211, around 9 o'clock this morning. Deputies say the victim appeared to be trying to use a hose on the big rig to put some air in a tire on the front end loader when the truck then began to roll. Then the man fell as he was trying to get out of the way. Investigators say it doesn't appear anyone was behind the wheel of the semi when it started moving. And new at six, living in foster care and making it through senior year in high school all during a pandemic. It's a huge accomplishment for more than 500 Texas foster kids about to graduate this year. Courtney Friedman shows us how a young local philanthropist is making sure those kids get a proper celebration. Jabez Tompkins isn't letting foster care or a global pandemic stop him from graduating. He spent the last three years at SJRC Texas, formerly known as St. Jude's Ranch for Children, a campus for at-risk foster children. It's been pretty hectic. I just been trying to get through it, you know, doing all my work, trying to graduate. He's one of 562 foster youth in Texas graduating high school this year. About 100 are in the Bear County region. Adopted Senior uh, 2020 was really just aiming towards giving foster children, a graduation gift, something that they can call their own. Hunter Beaton founded the nonprofit Day One Bags, offering high quality bags to foster kids, often traveling from home to home with belongings and trash bags. Last year, he started the Adopt a Senior program, giving gift filled bags to every graduating foster kid in Texas, and he's ready to do it again. I was excited because I got a whole bunch of stuff from my college dorm, so I got like bedding, lights, and decorations. Faith Edmonds was an SJRC foster kid who graduated last year. I think it was probably one of the best days of my life. Now a biochemical engineering student, she's thrilled peers like Tompkins will soon receive Adopt-A-Senior gifts. There's like thousands of people that are like, you know, willing to help me and like make sure like I'm okay. I feel special. Beaton needs all donations in by February 15th and hopes the community will band together like last year. To donate, head to the Adopt a 2021 Senior from Foster Care Facebook page, click sign up and fill out the Google donation form. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Awesome initiative. Well, several doctors from healthcare primary care were on hand today to help give away some fresh produce to seniors. Today's event, held in partnership with Via Soul Insurance Solutions, was dedicated to seniors 62 and up. The goal to promote heart health through healthy living. We're doing a heart healthy, uh, you know, produce, uh, you know, type of a bag. Uh, we're doing that for, of course, Valentine's and it's Heart Health Awareness Month as well. Um, so that's the reason why we had this produce for the seniors, so they can have some really good heart healthy foods to, to choose from. 
The bags included everything from corn, cabbage, zucchini squash, potatoes, and plenty of fruits. Those picking up also received information about staying heart healthy. Check out live cam right now. All right. Beautiful sunset, by the way, yeah. is it seems like the temperatures are ratcheting down from Saturday. Sunday a little cooler, yeah. Monday a little cooler. Great start, though, to the month yeah. of February. It is. It's been a wild ride temperature wise, and it's just going to get a little bit crazier here in the coming days. We started at 45 this morning, then made it up to 68 for the high temperature. You look at the evening and temperatures will quickly fall off down through the 50s. We're talking mid 50s at 8 p.m. 10 p.m. 49 degrees tomorrow morning. I think most of us will wake up to readings in the mid to upper 30s across South Texas, maybe briefly freezing in parts of the hill country. We'll be back to talk about our big roller coaster ride of temperatures and let you know how much warmer than cooler it's going to get coming right up. Last week, the mayor said that things seem to be trending in the right direction, especially with the number of hospitalizations that we're seeing. We expect an update any moment now from the mayor to talk about the latest numbers. Yeah, still a lot of concerns if those trends will hold as we enter the month of February. Uh, let's go ahead and head live now to City Hall with the very latest. Good evening. I'm Mayor Ron Nuremberg with Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf. Tonight we're joined by Dr. Anita Curin, who's Assistant Director of San Antonio Metro Health, and this is our COVID-19 update for our community. Tonight we're reporting 2,376 new cases of COVID-19 and our overall case total is 175,530. Uh, please note that that total that we're reporting tonight does include the state's reports from yesterday. So that's roughly a two day total for us. So our seven day rolling average is up slightly to 1,447. Unfortunately, we are also reporting nine new deaths tonight. Uh, they are between the ages of 40 and 70. Uh, and we are also sad to report that one of our own from the San Antonio Police Department has passed from COVID as well. Uh, so please keep those who are lost in their families and their survivors in your prayers tonight. Uh, we have lost far too many people to this virus and our, continue, uh, our community continues to mourn those who, who have passed. Let's also take a look at our hospitals. Uh, there are 1,171 patients being treated for COVID-19. Uh, that includes 99 new admissions since yesterday. Uh, in the 24-hour period, we haven't been below 100 new admissions since uh, the day after Christmas. So that's a welcome number in terms of new admissions overnight. 399 folks are in intensive care with COVID-19 and 244 on, on ventilators. It is Monday, so let's also take a look at our progress and warning indicators. Overall, we are still in the orange or severe level. However, we do have some positive updates for the third straight week. The positivity rate, which is the percentage of all COVID tests that are positive, has declined uh, significantly this time. The positivity rate now is 11.4%. Please do continue to social distance and mask up when you leave your household and avoid those uh, gathering with those who are outside of your household. Before I turn it over to Judge Wolf, let me also uh, share with you some very good news. The city of San Antonio is expected to receive 1,000 COVID-19 vaccines per week that will be dedicated to our homebound seniors over the age of 65. Metro Health, the Department of Human Services, and the San Antonio Fire Department are working with Meals on Wheels, San Antonio, and the San Antonio Housing Authority to identify and sign up those eligible residents who are homebound and unable to move from their homes, residents who need the vaccine uh, nevertheless. Our San Antonio Fire Department started making home visits today with vaccines in hand. We want to remind family members to take extra precautions when around older family members to make sure they are safe and healthy. So as you can see, San Antonio continues to innovate and make sure that we are getting those vaccines out to those who desperately need it and those who, in fact, uh, don't have uh, alternatives to get to uh, the sites for vaccines. So let me turn it now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And thank, uh, thank you for the city taking the lead on doing those home vaccines uh, that's really really important and because there are some people that have a really difficult time trying to get to the vaccine site and when you even when you get there you know you have difficulty also if you're in a wheelchair or whatever so um, thank you for thank you for doing that yeah it's good to see the infection rate 11.4 but don't forget now it's still twice over twice as much as it should be so we still have a good ways to go we just got to make sure that over this next 30 days or so as we kind of bring down the hospitals 
uh, hospitalization as well as the rate that we don't do anything that's going to shoot us back up the other way. We had just a little tiny jump in hospitalization today, but overall it is looking a lot better. You know, it's interesting. We talk about vaccines. I was out at the uh, out at the uh, center that we're doing on Wonderland Bear County Hospital, and uh, we're doing Mandela on the first floor and Pfizer on the second floor. And uh, when we talk about uh, how much more vaccine we need, the paraphernalia becomes very important also. This one here only can get five dates, uh, f- f- five shots out of the little bottle with this sort of syringe. With this syringe, I can get six. It's smaller, doesn't have quite a big a head. I can get six. That's a 20% increase in vaccine. So we're desperately trying to get more of these syringes and be able to use them. We'll do about 3,000 uh, today in vaccines uh, between the first floor and second floor, between Moderna and Pfizer. And uh, so we're, we're off to a really good start today, and we'll be doing that all week long uh, just for your second dose now. And then uh, next week we'll go back to uh, first dose along with some second doses uh, next week. You know, it's, it's interesting. We, we all work and we try to understand the uh, implications of how this disease moves around. And the National Football League, I would have never thought about this, but obviously they're very, very concerned about their own players. Not only they don't want them to catch COVID, they don't want their fans to get it, but if they have to uh, give up a football game, they've lost uh, millions and millions of dollars. So they do a lot of data collection. And it was interesting to me that, uh, you know, we generally say you have to be around someone for 15 minutes or so without the face mask in close proximity. Uh, they're finding out that it, you can be around them a lot less than 15 minutes and and still be able to pick up a big dose of the uh, of COVID from, from the person that you're that you're with. And, and they sort of came up with a four step plan. And I thought that was interesting also cumulative time that you spend with the person that may have had COVID, the distance you had from the person with COVID, whether there was good ventilation, were you outside or were you inside where the ventilation was not any good, and mask. And their uh, research is showing that if you violate two or more of those f- four uh, principles, uh, you're in a very high risk. So I thought it was pretty interesting to learn something uh, from football other than banging heads and uh, picking up a little bit more research. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Yeah, a lot of uh, medical research coming out of the Football League. And I I do want to also share with you, we've been talking about the challenge of shipment and supply of vaccines to our community and us doing the very best we can with the supplies that we do have. Uh, But it has been a challenge, nevertheless, uh, from the federal level. And I do want to let you know that the shipment of COVID-19 vaccines to tomorrow's scheduled second dose appointments has been delayed by the Texas State Health Department. And as a result, all appointments scheduled for tomorrow, Tuesday, February 2nd through Thursday, February 4th at the Dome will be rescheduled for February 16th through the 18th. Those are the Dome scheduled second dose appointments. If you were scheduled to receive your second dose this Tuesday through Thursday, Metro Health will be communicating with you via phone or email that you provided for rescheduling that second dose appointment. That's the only week that will be affected. We do apologize for this convenience as we know some are concerned about the extended time between their second dose, but please know that we are within the CDC guidelines to ensure that there are no issues with the efficacy, the effectiveness of the vaccine. All right, a little long there uh, in what we've been covering the uh, briefing, but basically the mayor there talking about the delay in second doses for people at the Alamo Dome Metro Health will let you know about that. But that's because of a delay in the vaccines arriving. Uh, also interesting that we are seeing a decline in the positivity rate to 11.4%. That's great, but they want it down to 5% or less. Uh, And I was also struck by something that the mayor talked about homebound seniors. Yeah, he talked about uh, getting 1000 COVID-19 vaccines a week dedicated to those homebound seniors. They're going to be working with organizations like Meals on Wheels, the fire department, as you heard, to orchestrate uh, giving those out. Another piece of positive news to come out of that briefing was that uh, 99 new admissions happened within the past 24 hours. And we haven't been below 100 new new admissions since the day after Christmas. So a couple pieces of good news to come out of that briefing. And I want to make sure people understand the delay is for people who got their first shot at the Alamo Dome. It's for their second shot, not affecting what's going on uh, at Wonderland of America's Mall and some of the other places in town. As a matter of fact, uh, the county judge talked about they did 3,000 second doses today 
uh, at Wonderland of the Americas. All right, let's switch over to weather right now and talk about the fact that uh, we're seeing a cold front and it's going to get colder. Well, we're going to be up and down a lot. Okay, all right. <laughs> It'll get Roller cooler. Coaster. Yeah, it'll get colder after it gets warmer. So first we're going to warm up and then we're going to drop off again. Let's take a look at our weather pattern. I wish I could say that would bring us rain, but we had another sunny day today and we'll see some clouds up above us coming off the Pacific tonight and through the day tomorrow. There is an active weather pattern, actually very active. West Coast system coming on shore. East Coast, big nor'easter, big snow producer there. So two big dips in our upper level flow, big disturbances. But over us, we've got this bump, that ridge, which of course favors dry weather. Let's talk about temperatures. This is going to be the big fluctuation throughout the week. Looking dry and rain free, even with a few cold fronts coming down the pike. 64 right now, comfortable, beautiful day. Dew point of 22, clear sky, not much of a breeze ideal radiational cooling. So this evening, temperatures falling off quickly. I think by 10 p.m. we'll be in the upper 40s at least. Kerrville right now at 59, Hondo 65, 58 Gonzales, and right now Crazel Springs at 64 along with San Antonio. So let's get to tomorrow morning sunrise when we typically hit our low temperature right near freezing in the hill country. I think mid to upper 30s elsewhere, about 37 Helotus, 35 Timberwood Park, 36 in Elmendorf in Lake Hills, Myco area at about 35. Then by the afternoon tomorrow, we're well into the 60s. So jacket weather in the morning, but you can have short sleeves by the afternoon, no problem, especially because we will have a lot of sunshine. It's looking like another sunny day. For some reason, the symbols disappeared here, but they would read sunny if they were on there. A glitch in the system. So another sunny day tomorrow. And you look ahead, and we will have some areas of fog Wednesday and Thursday mornings, but otherwise generally sunny days. It's the temperature drop. Okay, 60s tomorrow, 70s Wednesday, Thursday 80. And then we're back down into the 60s Friday, Sunday, another shot of cooler air in the 50s for highs. All right. Thank you, Adam. We'll be right back with sports. Our San Antonio Spurs will be hosting the Memphis Grizzlies for the second time after falling the Memphis 129 to 112 just this past Saturday. This is the fourth time this season the Spurs have faced the same team in consecutive games, splitting with the Houston Rockets and the Minnesota Timberwolves and swept by the Lakers. It's a move by the NBA this year during the COVID-19 pandemic to try and limit travel. Does a quick turnaround make it easier on the players to game plan? Yeah, sort of, kind of, but we're all professionals at this point. You know, every game... Uh, we, we treat every game the same, so tomorrow is going the same game plan. Um, we're going to talk about it. We're still going to make an emphasis on certain things and what we can improve on, and, you know, that's that. All right, here's a matchup tonight, 7.30. Highlights for you tonight on the Night Beat. Texas Longhorns head basketball coach Shocker Smart has returned to his team after testing positive for the coronavirus and their game against Kentucky on Saturday had to be called off due to COVID concerns with the Wildcats. Smart revealing to reporters today after exiting isolation that he had to leave his family in order to deal with his symptoms. I'll be honest with you. I had significant symptoms from it. Um, so this was not a walk in the park for me. Not saying it has been for anyone else. Um, um, and I definitely, uh, you know, when you go through that kind of stuff, it certainly, you know, swirls some things around your mind. Okay. Texas, who dropped to number six in the latest college basketball AP poll, is due to host number two, Baylor, tomorrow night in Austin. And Shaka Smart says all of his players should be available. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. It's Super Bowl week like no other in NFL history. This was supposed to be media day in Tampa, Florida, but with the COVID-19 pandemic, the Chiefs are not even in Florida. The defending Super Bowl champs won't arrive until Friday. Interviews are being done on Zoom with just nine players each from the Buccaneers and the Chiefs that you can catch tonight on the NFL Network. Here's a matchup for the big game. We'll have more about the game tonight on the night beat. 530 kickoff, Raymond James Stadium in Tampa, Florida. We haven't had a chance to visit with former Super Bowl champion Baltimore Ravens head coach Brian Billick about the drama unfolding in both the Houston Texans and the Dallas Cowboys revolving around their quarterbacks on instant replay. But we also wanted to know what he thought of our chances of landing an NFL franchise here in San Antonio. Not now. There's just too much going on, too many different revenue streams they have to tap into. Uh, and the owners, uh, you, know, you know, they only want to cut that up so many ways. Uh, so, yeah, eventually that could happen, but I don't think it's, uh, it's on the horizon for a while. 
All right, Billick is currently based in Columbus, Ohio, a city that is similar situation to San Antonio, trying to get a professional NFL team. But there are a number of limitations to expanding the number of teams in the league, one of which is their relative proximity to other franchises. Does being so close to the Cowboys and Texans impact San Antonio's chances of landing their own franchise in the future? Whatever city you look at, there's going to be something in proximity that you could say, I don't know, it's, it's big enough, but yeah, you know, like Columbus, really, you got Cleveland, you got Cincinnati, you got Pittsburgh, you really could Columbus absorb one? Uh, so everybody's going to have a little bit of a qualifier that way. But if anybody could, to me, uh, Houston and San Antonio would be one. All right, you can read more about Billick's thoughts on the Cowboys, the Texans, and X-Tech, a company developing state-of-the-art football pads on the Instant Replay page at ksat.com. Not the news we all want to hear, but we all suspect that eventually down the road, San Antonio will be the home to an NFL franchise. It should be. Has to be. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Got it. KSAT Q&A is coming up next. It is a fact of life in this day and age with so many coronavirus cases out there, there's a good chance that you know somebody who had it. We certainly know somebody who had it here at KSAT 12, one of many people been affected. Uh, and we had to look at our sales department. Sales account executive Jessica Backey joins us now live in our KSAT Q&A. Jessica, thank you for joining us. I, I was struck by the email that you sent out to the station describing what happened with your family. I mean, this is, this is something that, you know, when you first heard your coronavirus positive, what went through your mind? Well, the first thing is um, disbelief. And then you're completely frightened and shell-shocked. And what do you do now? And so as soon as we got tested, you know, we did the protocol. Of, like the first five or six days, we were like, huh, this isn't so bad. It's not as bad as, as a cold. We had the aches, headaches, um, fever, um, but pretty much low-grade fever for the first five or six days. But then when day seven hit, it like hit us like a freight train. And we both started feeling really bad. The fever increased. Um, and we were taking, you know, Tylenol, Motrin, trying to keep that intact. And your the fatigue and brain fog sets in. Um, and then I started to lose my taste and smell about then as well. And what was so, what's so scary is you'll go through a day like day seven hit. And I was like, huh, I woke up and I felt a little better. And I thought I was, you know, taking a turn, but then it hits you again. So it's like every other day. And the scariest part about it is you don't know like when you should go to the hospital, when not. And what my, one of my biggest recommendations that everyone should have at home is one of those pulse oximeters because in a thermometer, of course, constantly monitoring your fever and your um, oxygen level and your pulse because what ended up happening about day eight um, my lungs were okay and my oxygen level maintained 98 99 but my husband's temperature started spiking to 104 mm. and his um, oxygen level started to drop below 95 so we were lucky um, enough that we had a friend that there was a doctor that came and checked on him and they put us on some antibiotics for, you know, bacterial pneumonia, just to be ca um, careful. And then by day 13, um, Joe, I started panicking because he had had fever up to 104 um, nonstop, you know, at night and couldn't sleep. And then his oxygen level started dipping into the 80s. So I called him. And at that time, what was so scary is there were no COVID beds available. And so we had to get on a waiting list. And luckily, um, that night, he was able to get a bed in the ICU, which saved his life because um, his pulse was up to 150 when it should be, you know, well below, you know, in the 80s, well below 100. And he um, could have gone into cardiac arrest. And as soon as they got there, they gave him, thank goodness, the convalescent plasma, which is so important. And the doctor told him to turn over on his stomach, say a prayer and go to sleep. And they would know if it would work within 24 hours. And, and he was, be, he, was beyond, he was beyond, he was beyond, sorry, Jessica, to interrupt you, but he was beyond uh -huh. the remdesivir and some of the other uh, treatments. Yes. So, All and yes, the, 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 mm -hmm. the blood was basically the last chance. Yes. The convalescent plasma that people with the antibodies donate. 
So I am going to donate on Wednesday. I would highly beg anyone who has had this and has the antibodies to go donate their plasma because it saves lives, especially if you're beyond the remdesivir, which can only be, which I we were told, um, given to in the hospital, but he was too far gone. And so then you towards like, when do I go to the hospital? Yeah. You know, because the doctor's trying to keep you out of the hospital and you, you want to stay out of the hospital. So it's a very scary, very scary situation. And you definitely need an advocate. You know, you're a family member, yourself. I mean, ask for that plasma when you go in, if you do get admitted to the hospital, because it has worked. And I'm my, my, I lost my stepfather in August to this, um, to this virus because he waited too long to get into the hospital. And by that time, you know, he was put on the ventilator and it was too, it was too late. Jessica, your family has been through quite the ordeal. We've got about a minute left in this segment. I just want to ask you really quickly, how are you doing today? We are, do, um, we are doing great. Joe has been doing better and getting stronger every day. Um, I did want to give put a word out to everyone that one of the things I've learned from this, it is so important to keep your nutrients, your vitamin Ds, your vitamin Cs and zinc. They say that having a um, good nutritional base um, it's so important because it's all about the host. Like everyone's DNA is different. They don't know who's it, who it's going to attack. Joe was a very healthy young person and it took, look at what it did to him. And that's so what I want to, that's, that's, that's what I want to point out. I mean, you, you don't have underlying health conditions. You're mm -hmm. not considered elderly. I mean, there are a lot of people who think, well, that's who this is attacking. And it's clearly not true. Right. It's not the case. And they said, so most of the, my, our doctor told us that most of the people that have died in the hospital have been either vitamin D or C deficient. Okay. So they highly recommend, you know, taking those supplements, um, keeping hydrated, um, you know, keep you on your electrolytes. Jessica, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I'm so happy to hear that you guys are on the up and up and doing better. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you so much. Take care. We'll be right back. How you handle the winter weather could be all about the attitude. And if that's the case, <laughs> look at this. The pandas at the National Zoo definitely are taking it better than most in the Northeast as it gets hit hard by a winter storm. Pandas Mei Yang and Tian Tian are having a ball in the snow in Washington, D.C. They're like kids. Yes. That winter storm has a lot of states under winter weather warnings. Several inches of snow falling. These two, though, they're not thinking about digging out. They're digging in, sliding down hills, rolling over and over in the snow. And uh, super cute. Adam, I know you've been to that zoo before. I mean, it's it's built for those pandas. It, it, it's all about the pandas. Yeah. It is. And nothing's better for the uh, their live camera, their panda cam, than a baby being born yes. or any kind of snow event. Snow. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. Sunny, well, of course, we had a lot of sunshine out there today and a beautiful sunset, clear sky now. We started the day at 45, made it up to 68, both being a few degrees above average, both the low and the high. And across South Texas, for the most part, upper 60s right near 70. Catula made it to 73. Del Rio had a high of 70. Meanwhile, Kerrville topped out at 66. Huge temperature changes on the way. We're going to warm up and then fall right off again. We actually have a couple of cold fronts to talk about here in a few minutes. Happy February, everybody. It's That's a beautiful right. day out there today. A great way to start mm -hmm. it, Adam. Yeah, it's kicking off February with a nice sunny day, crisp in the morning, comfortable in the afternoon. We're going to see some big changes here this throughout this first week of February. We'll cool off quickly tonight. It's going to be a comfortable evening, but you know, after sunset now, temperature is really falling fast, and I think by 10 p.m. we'll be in the 40s. Our dry weather pattern, it continues. I know we could use some rainfall. Unfortunately, it's just not really in the works. And then big temperature swings. And that comes down to our overall weather pattern. So let's take a look at the weather, not just here, but elsewhere, because there is an active weather pattern. It's just not over Texas. See some activity moving into the West Coast, desert southwest, all the way up through Oregon, Washington, Northern California. They're getting some activity. There's a dip in the upper level flow there. Then, of course, the East Coast has the big nor'easter, big wound up East Coast storm system dumping already over a foot of snow measured in Central Park in New York City. Here we're in the middle. We've got this bump in the upper level flow. So up the midsection of the country, just quiet and what you could just call fair weather. 
This will change. We're going to see a big dip in the upper level flow later this week and into the weekend, and that's going to cause a bit of an Arctic outbreak. Doesn't mean rainfall for us, but it will cause a big temperature drop off by Friday and then again throughout the weekend. So our weather pattern is fairly active when you look at it overall. It's not a flat pattern. Whenever these lines are just straight west to east, nothing's happening out there. The air masses aren't moving, but when you get these big dips, oh yeah, things are moving. Air masses are moving and that stirs things up. So let's talk temperatures. Right now we're at 64. Dew point of 22, dry air, not much of a breeze, clear sky. Temps falling off quickly this evening. Good radiational cooling. We're still 68 Catula, but 56 in Kerrville. Fredericksburg at 52, 64 here in San Antonio. Tomorrow morning, I'm thinking mid to upper 30s for most of us. We'll be about 41 Del Rio and Eagle Pass, 36 Pleasanton. Gonzales about 34, so just above freezing most locations. Around Bear County, I'm thinking between about 35 and 38 degrees. You know, Elmendorf 36, uh, downtown 38, even Leon Springs about 36. Bernie, tomorrow morning, just a few degrees above freezing. So jacket weather in the morning, but by the afternoon, you can be in short sleeves, no problem. Maybe a sweatshirt for the kids at the bus stop, and then later on in the day, we're talking upper 60s to right near 70 degrees. And then, We'll, of course, still have a lot of sunshine tomorrow, just some mid-level clouds, but temperatures will continue to rise. And look at the temperature trend here. 60s today, tomorrow. 70s on Wednesday. Thursday, we make it up to 80 degrees. It's going to be that spring-like feel in the air again, only to all come crashing down. From 80 on Thursday, down closer to 60 on Friday. So nearly a 20 degree temperature drop in afternoon highs. So this is one of those weeks where you can't, really plan for tomorrow based on what happened today because we're going to see some big changes as we go throughout the week and then we get a reinforcing shot of colder air as we get into Sunday. So that should drop us down into the 50s for highs. So we're looking at a big temperature range here peaking on Thursday at 80 and then bottoming out on Sunday down in the 50s. So very different conditions and big temperature swings on the way. As for sky conditions, anticipate a lot of sunshine and mainly dry. We'll have some fog and dampness Wednesday and Thursday mornings, but otherwise pretty sunny days. Friday, a little extra cloud cover, but I don't think it's going to bring us any rainfall. And then despite the colder weather, as we get into Sunday, we're not expecting any rain either, really even an increase in the cloud cover. So I know we could use the moisture. We need rain. It's just not favored in our this kind of weather pattern now. So I was thinking about putting the TV out to watch the Super Bowl on Sunday. Maybe stoke like up the blanket. fire pit next yeah. to you. <laughs> okay, all right. In or case, just stay inside. Yeah, in that would work. In case you too. missed it, it's coming up next. Here's today's in case you missed it. Good morning. It is Monday. It is February 1st. Those who were hoping to receive their second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine at the Alamo Dome this week are going to have to wait a little bit longer. According to the city, the vaccine shipment, which would have supplied the scheduled doses, has been delayed by the state. The COVID-19 pandemic crashing San Antonio's biggest party for the second year in a row. Fiesta 2021 postponing from April until June. New at five is Governor Greg Abbott gives his state of the state address tonight. He'll be laying out some of his legislative agenda. One issue he's unlikely to mention, but is among local leaders priorities is the expansion of Medicaid. Opting in would expand eligibility to people earning a certain income threshold. But as part of the 2010 Affordable Care Act, it's been a partisan issue across the country and certainly in Texas, which remains one of 12 states that haven't chosen to opt in. New details surrounding a deadly crash. The medical examiner's office identifying the woman killed as 36-year-old Carissa Kahutek. Police safe when she crashed into a ditch near Casa Bella and UTSA Boulevard. Her vehicle got stuck under some drainage tunnels. Kahutek was pronounced dead at the scene. Investigators have ruled the crash an accident. Delicate balance as President Joe Biden weighs achieving bipartisanship versus delivering urgent economic relief. I support passing COVID relief with support from Republicans if we can get it, but the COVID relief has to pass. After the president proposed a near $2 trillion coronavirus stimulus package, he's facing his first test on his unity pledge with millions of Americans desperate for relief hanging in the balance. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, today is the beginning of Black History Month. It also marks a major milestone in American history. Today is National Freedom Day. Friday, or February 1st, 1865 is the day President Abraham Lincoln signed the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery in the United States. A former slave in Philadelphia named Richard Robert Wright Sr. pushed for the creation of National Freedom Day to celebrate. President Harry Truman signed the bill proclaiming National Freedom Day in 1948. For many years, National Freedom Day was marked in Philadelphia with a wreath laying ceremony at the Liberty Bell. Look at those big temperature changes. We'll be in the 60s again tomorrow afternoon. 70s Wednesday gets even warmer on Thursday, right near 80. And then we fall back off again. 60s Friday, Saturday, and then a reinforcing shot of cooler air into Super Bowl Sunday. So simply put, the warmest day is Thursday at 80, and then we'll cool down into the 50s for highs by Sunday. So big ups and downs. I wish we could say that some rain was coming with those transitions as it sometimes does, but unfortunately we're looking dry. All right, thank you, Adam, and thanks so much for watching the six o'clock news. See you back here at 10.